The land on which Ringwood Manor sits is considered both sacred and spiritual to many. The Lenape tribe, which originally occupied the area, recognized that there were special earth forces here. So it's no surprise that workers and visitors to the manor claim to have felt and seen several manifestations, not all of which, however, occur in the manor. It was a stressful day at work, so I just more or less took a walk. And I walked, um, I walked over towards like where the graveyard is. What Pat was about to witness is something that she would not soon forget. I saw in the woods um, and heard in the woods um, militia. I heard drums and I saw in the woods the, the militia going towards um, Tuxedo. Company, take care. Find the column by the left wheel. March. As I watched the, the militia go walk through the woods, I looked up the road, I saw a white horse, and I saw um, what would be George Washington. They were dressed in the colonial garb. Company, present arms. Mourn firelocks. It really unnerved me. It was like overwhelming, so I did turn around and go back to the office. Pat Manning came into my office and she said, I see a lot of colonial soldiers and it was, there's a foreboding atmosphere here. I said, did anything happen this particular day in during the colonial period? It happened to be October the 2nd the anniversary of Erskine's death and funeral. We are gathered here to honor a fallen hero. Brother Erskine died in service to his country and will join a long list of heroes without whom none of us would today be here. So mote it be. She said, it, it's so heavy. Um, I, it's just a very bad feeling I have, and it's a, a, a foreboding feeling of sadness. And I said, well, he died in 1780 on October 2nd. And that was the day that she felt the, uh, and saw colonial soldiers. Shoulder, fire locks. So that particular day, 200 years um, in the future, I saw what happened in the past. Besides being a historical site, Ringwood Manor catered a world of social events, and the Hewitts were the hosts. Their concept of this house was a social, a site for very, very, very gay fun social events. It's an interesting place. Uh, there are a lot of phenomena that go on here. Uh, what you see here as decorative effects and rooms and furnishings and a house, a brick, you know, stone or wood house, isn't necessarily all that's here. Uh, there's an alternative reality that overlays this one occasionally. All of a sudden, it'll flicker and you can see their reality overlaid on this one. The first inkling was again in the conservatory, um, and they had people in beautiful, it was summertime, and the women were in white frilled or lace dresses, and the men were in usually wearing blazers, white slacks. This was their whole thing. They loved groups of people staying here. They loved house guests. They loved dinners. They loved parties. Um, as a consequence, this house still vibrates with that. It has a very welcoming, very open atmosphere that I understand people, other people that have visited here uh, have described also. Six decades later, the manor still welcomes visitors. My feeling was that there needed to be a forum for people like myself who were being called to the manor or being called to know the family or the people of Ringwood Manor. And as I started to ask people questions about their experiences, there were so many 
that I felt compelled to ask Bert if he was open to the idea of a very intimate tour, a tour where we would come in, where the ropes would come down, and we would invite people into the manor to get to know the family, to get to know the intent of the people who seem to still be here. And it's on these tours that most of the unexplained occurrences have been witnessed. We were outside of Miss Sally's room. We weren't going to go in it because she didn't seem that she wanted us there. We saw the rope that tied away the room going like this, slowly. And then it happened again in the bathroom. On one occasion, a psychic was with us, and she mentioned that before she even came into the house, she saw the spirit of Mrs. Hewitt straightening the welcome mat and encouraging her to come in. There were definite presences here. Um, as I went from room to room, those presences changed dramatically um, from a childlike presence to an adult presence to an elderly presence. Um, as far as the Hewitts and the Coopers, I get a very, very strong feeling that a lot of the family are still here. As we continue through the house, we've had people in Mr. Hewitt's room report that they have smelled cigar smoke. I was standing out in the hall in front of the nursery and I smelled tobacco. I don't know if it was pipe or cigar, but it was a very strong sense, a pungent sense of tobacco. That the mannequin in the hallway has turned by itself or that there is a spirit in Mrs. Hewitt's bedroom that pinches children that think about sitting on her furniture. I was walking into the ladies room and I was looking around and I was walking around in the room and I went near the bed and, so, and I felt like something pulled me. I felt something tug at my hood on my jacket and I looked around and I didn't see anything there and I asked my mom if uh, she tugged on my hood and she said no. In addition to the Hewitts, there are other ghosts that inhabit the manor. The ghost that is is supposed to be in the Ryerson side of the house is a spirit that comes in, slams the door, and stomps up the stairs. That is one of the traditional ghosts. The other traditional ghost is Robert Erskine, who meets you at Drinkbrook and escorts you with a blue light along the Colonial Road to his grave site. And he disappears. And, and while he's walking, there is a, um, a blue lantern that uh, clanks on his shin bone. The third spirit that is traditional is known as Black Mag. Black Mag emanates from a fissure on the other side of the property here from the mining area, and she guards the western side of the mining area. Why is it so important for them to protect these grounds? Find out when we return.